नमस्कार गुड इवनिंग व्यूअर्स यू आर वॉचिंग सनसर टी वी एंड दिस इज द न्यूज विद मी भावना नहीं है ओवर द नेक्स्ट थर्टी मिनट्स वी ब्रिंग यू द टॉप डेवलपमेंट्स ऑफ द डे फ्रॉम अक्रॉस दी वर्ल्ड बट फर्स्ट अप द हेडलाइंस India committed to green growth and clean energy Prime Minister Narendra Modi addresses G7 session on climate energy and health meets heads of Germany US France and South Africa G7 tightens sanctions on Russia set to cap Russian oil prices promises support to Ukraine for as long as it takes Opposition presidential candidate Yashwant Sinha files nomination top opposition leaders including Rahul Gandhi Sharad Pawar Akhilesh Yadav present TRS extends support Supreme Court grants relief to rebel Shiv Sena MLAs puts disqualification proceedings on hold till 11th of July asks Uddhav government to provide security to rebel MLAs Flood situation improves in Assam 22 lakh people still reeling under floods relief and rescue operations continue After the headlines let's take a quick look at some more important stories of the day Defence Minister Rajnath Singh holds talk with Malaysia Senior Defence Minister Hashimuddin bin Hussein via video conference. Both ministers reaffirmed the strong defence relations between India and Malaysia. Union Minister Nitin Gadkari inaugurates and lays foundation stone of nine national highways projects in Rajasthan worth over 1300 crore rupees. Union Health Minister says center will roll out one nation one dialysis program patients undergoing dialysis will be able to get the procedure done anywhere in the country at any time dates for ugc net 2022 exams announced the ugc net 2022 exam will begin on july 8th and conclude on august 14 Two terrorists have been killed in an ongoing gun battle in Kulgam district of Jammu and Kashmir. Security forces cordon off area following a tip off. A software delivery delay has forced NASA to postpone its Psyche mission. According to the reports, the Psyche spacecraft will only reach the asteroid on as late as 2029 or 2030. At least 21 teenagers, the youngest possibly just 13, died at the weekend after a night out at a township tavern in South Africa. Cause of tragedy remains unclear. Nifty ends above 15,800. Sensex gains 433 points, led by IT, oil, and gas metals. All the sectoral indices ends in the green, with IT index rising over 2 percent and metal climbing 1.5 percent. Sri Lankan women defeated India in the third and final T20 match. India make 100, 138 for five batting first. Sri Lanka win by seven wickets with three overs to spare. India win series to 2-1. England win the Test series against New Zealand 3-0. Host win the Leeds Test by seven wickets. And now the top story of the day. Prime Minister Narendra Modi addressed the session on investing in a better future, climate, energy, health at the G7 summit in Germany, showcasing India's commitment to clean energy and green growth. Prime Minister Modi highlighted India's track record and said it has achieved the target of 40% energy capacity from non-fossil sources nine years before time. He stated that India has the world's first fully solar-powered airport. India's huge railway system will become net zero in this decade. He asserted that India's dedication to climate commitments is evident from its performance, expressing hope that G7 nations will support India's efforts in combating climate change. He invited them to tap the huge market for clean energy technologies emerging in the country. He added that G7 countries can invest in research, innovation and manufacturing in this field, which can make technology affordable for the whole world. Prime Minister Modi was welcomed by German Chancellor Olaf Scholz at the G7 summit. Before the start of the summit, Prime Minister Modi shook hands with US President Joe Biden and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau as the leaders assembled for a group photo.
Prime Minister Narendra Modi held bilateral meetings on the sidelines of the G7 summit. He held talks with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. The two leaders discussed cooperation in key sectors like commerce and energy and further environmentally friendly growth for the planet. He also met French President Emmanuel Macron at Scholz El Mao discussed a range of bilateral and global issues over a cup of tea. Prime Minister Modi also met South African President Cyril Ramaphosa and discussed the full range of opportunities for an enhanced economic and defence cooperation. He also held a bilateral meeting with Indonesian President Joko Widodo. And now we have a senior correspondent, Akhilesh Suman, on this. Uh, Akhilesh, what developments do you think that has took place at the G7 summit today? And what was the importance of India's intervention in this session? See, Bhavana, one of the most important things that uh, has taken place, that is uh, a resolution by the G7 nations. And this resolution condemns, uh, you know, Russia's war over Ukraine. And also it hints that uh, China, whatever China is doing with the uh, smaller countries, underdeveloped countries in the uh, uh, way of uh, helping them is not acceptable to G7 nations. And that is why an infrastructure fund has been uh, you know, announced by the G7 nations and it is of $600 billion. By this fund, they will uh, invest in developing nations for building uh, infrastructure that will help in combating environment uh, degradation and also creating an in infrastructure that will help them uh, develop the nations uh, for the future challenges. So I think one of the most important thing that is this. And another thing that they are telling that, you know, uh, these G7 nations will help uh, Ukraine for whatever period the war is going on between Russia and Ukraine. And that is very important thing that, you know, they condemned Russia and they also told that the gold export from Russia would be banned in G7 nations. And you know that 5% uh, gold is uh, of all over the world is exported from Russia. So this will, you know, uh, uh, hamper the Russia's... Uh, uh, you know, revolves in a big way. So um, I think uh, G7 nations have told that, you know, that this will be one of the major punishments that uh, these nations will be uh, taking place. And also that uh, they told that, uh, you know, that they will uh, punish Russia in many other ways. So one thing and two things. So the third thing you are asking about Prime Minister Narendra Modi's intervention. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has spoken about, you know, the climate place that uh, G7 nations have made earlier. And he has made it very right, clear Agnesh. that the whole theory of, whole theory that uh, a common but differentiated responsibility through which the developed nations have right, to help Agnesh. the developing that, nations that, in the... Thank you for that update, Akhilesh. Moving ahead, opposition presidential candidate Yashwan Sinha filed his nomination papers today. The opposition parties have also formed an 11-member campaign committee for their candidate. Senior opposition leaders including Congress Rahul Gandhi, Malikarjun Khadke, Jairam Ramesh, Akshok Gehlot, NCP Chief Sharad Pawar, SP Chief Akhilesh Yadav and National Conference Leader Farooq Abdullah accompanied him. TMC's Abhishek Banerjee and Saugat Roy, DMK's Teruchi Siva and A.E. Raja, CPIM's Sitaram Yachuri and CPIM's D. Raja were also present while Sinha filed his papers. Sena handed over four sets of nomination papers to Rajya Sabha Secretary General P.C. Modi, who is the returning officer for the presidential election. After filing the nomination papers, Sena paid homage to Mahatma Gandhi and B.R. Ambedkar at their statues inside Parliament complex. Sena was named as the common opposition candidate for the presidential election on June 21. Polling for the presidential election will take place on 18th of July. TRS has also extended support to opposition candidate Yashwan Sinha. Party leader K.T. Rama Rao, the son of Telangana Chief Minister K. Chandrasekhar Rao, was also present when Sinha filed his papers. And now let's move on to Maharashtra, where the tussle between the Shiv Sena leadership and rebel MLAs continues. In a relief to rebel Shiv Sena MLAs, the Supreme Court on Monday gave time till 11th of July 
to respond to disqualification notices. The top court also sought responses to pleas by rebel MLAs questioning the legality of notices seeking their disqualification. The top court, however, refused to pass any interim order on the plea of the Maharashtra government that there should not be any flow test in the assembly and said they cannot always approach in case of illegibility. The Supreme Court also issues notices to the Maharashtra Deputy Speaker directing him to put on affidavit records of no trust notices served upon him by rebel MLAs. The Apex Court has also directed the Maharashtra government to provide adequate security to rebel leader Eknath Shinde and other rebel MLAs. The Maharashtra government said that adequate security steps have already been taken and it will further ensure that there is no harm to the life, liberty and property of the 39 MLAs and their families. Meanwhile, Maharashtra Chief Minister Uddhav Thakre has stripped the rebel ministers of their portfolios and relocated to others. And news now from across the nation. The flood situation in Assam continued to remain critical with five new deaths taking the death toll to 126. More than 22 lakh people remain affected, although water level has started receding from some areas. Chief Minister Himanta Biswa Sharma on Sunday visited Silchar in Kachar district, which is among the worst affected areas. President Ramnath Kovind today visited Vrindavan in Uttar Pradesh and offered prayers at Banke Bihari Temple. He stressed upon the social support for remarriage of widows and destitute women and their economic independence. Himachal Pradesh Chief Minister Jairam Thakur on Sunday flagged off vehicles of the Department of State Taxes and Excise to deal with drug peddling effectively in Shimla. He also informed a special task force would be constituted to curb the drug menace in the state. A court in Ahmedabad has remanded social activist Tista Sitalwar and former Gujarat Director General of Police R.B. Sri Kumar to police custody till July 2 in a case of fabricating evidence to frame innocent persons in connection with the 2002 Gujarat riots. India reported 17,073 fresh COVID cases in the last 24 hours, raising its tally to 4 crore 34 lakh 7,046, a jump of 45 percent. As many as 11,739 new COVID-19 cases and 25 deaths were recorded in the country on Sunday. In the year 2020, 21 Indians, 77 lakh workers, were engaged in the gig economy and they constituted 1.5% of the total workforce of the nation. These are the findings of a report launched by Niti Ayo. Gig economy is a labor market characterized by short-term contract or freelance workers. According to the report, the gig workforce is expected to expand to 2.35 crore workers by 2029-2030. At present, about 47% of the gig work is in medium-skilled jobs, about 22% in high-skilled and about 31% in low-skilled jobs. Slipping into a short break here, but on the other side, a unique initiative to save coral reefs in Kenya. All this after this short break. You stay tuned to Sansa TV. Welcome back after the break. You're watching the news and time now for all the main developments from the Russia-Ukraine war front. The G7 nation said that they are committed to Ukraine's security and resilience at the ongoing 47th summit in Germany. In a statement delivering full support 
to Ukraine, they said the G7 will continue to provide financial, humanitarian, military and diplomatic support and stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes. It also stated that efforts will continue to provide Ukraine with military and defense equipment. The G7 leaders are also ready to reach arrangements with interested countries and Ukraine on sustained security commitments. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky joined the G7 summit underway at Schloss Elmau in Germany via video call. During the call, Zelensky asked for more modern air defense system after a series of deadly attacks on the capital, Kiev, as well as the regions of Mykolaiv, Cherniv and Lyukiv. He also called for more sanctions on Russia and security guarantees for Ukraine. The co-chair of U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee, James Risch, held a meeting with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky in Kiev on Monday. During the meeting, the leaders discussed recent Russian strikes on Ukraine, U.S.-Ukrainian cooperation in the defense sphere and the tightening of sanctions against Moscow. Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv, is under renewed fire after weeks of relative calm. Kharkiv governor has said that the constant shelling by Russian forces killed two women and wounded five people in the region. The deaths occurred in the northern Chungyevsky district that borders Russia. Ukrainian military has accused Belarus of supporting Russia. Spokesperson for the Ukrainian military claimed that Belarus has been providing Russia with military support. He also claimed that the Ukrainian army has conducted successful operations and made Russian troops retreat in some areas of Luhansk region. And time now for some other global updates. Russia defaulted on its foreign sovereign bonds for the first time since the Bolshevik Revolution. Sweeping sanctions have effectively cut the country off from the global financial system and rendered its assets untouchable for many investors. Take a look at this report. The White House on Monday released a fact sheet detailing potential G7 actions to support Ukraine and further stem Moscow's oil revenues. A U.S. official said the sovereign debt default by Russia showed how dramatically the sanctions were impacting its economy. Russia has struggled to keep up payments on $40 billion of outstanding bonds as sanctions cut it off from the global financial system and rendered its assets untouchable to many investors. The Kremlin has repeatedly said there are no grounds to default, but it is unable to send money to bondholders because of sanctions accusing the West of trying to drive it into an artificial default. A formal default is largely symbolic given that Russia cannot borrow internationally at the moment. But the stigma could raise its borrowing costs in future. The payments in question are $100 million in interest on two bonds, one denominated in US dollars and another in euros. Russia was due to pay on May 27th. The payments had a grace period of 30 days which expired on Sunday. Bureau report, Sunset TV. Moving ahead, divers in Kenya are helping to restore coral reefs by planting special structures that encourage displaced corals to regrow. It comes as the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon discusses how to protect these valuable ecosystems. Here's the report. These four divers are at the front line of saving coral reefs in the sea of Kenya's coast. They are carrying shoes and toothbrushes to a reef restoration site near Wasini Island of the Shimoni Channel. Their activity is to clean up the coral nurseries. The structures are made up of plastic pipes and pyramid-structured steel nets. The Wasini Island Coral Initiative is one among many others dotting the Indian Ocean that started after severe coral bleaching incidents. So far, it has planted over 8,000 corals a year and placed some 800 artificial reef structures to reclaim the coral gardens in Wasini. The group searches for dislodged and dying coral. The coral are transplanted and nurtured back to life in underwater nurseries with frames built by conservation workers at the Refoliation Foundation. Coral bleaching takes place when extreme temperatures and sun glare are in tandem 
triggering corals to flush out algae and die. The El Nino phenomena of 1998 led to massive coral deaths in the Indian Ocean, stretching from Somalia to South Africa and also island states. Bleached corals undermine fisheries as they can't support marine life. Mass coral bleaching directly linked to climate change along the Western Indian Ocean has worried scientists for decades and intensive studies are ongoing to understand and map out interventions to curb the phenomena. But not all conservationists are convinced whether this type of coral restoration will be successful. According to the Wildlife Conservation Society's own experience, it is expensive and many of the transplanted corals don't survive. Bureau Report, Sunset TV. And now news from across the world. Iran has launched a solid-fueled rocket into space, Zuyana. A 25.5-meter-long rocket is capable of carrying a satellite of 220 kilograms that will ultimately gather data in low Earth orbit and promote Iran's space industry. Iran, which long has said it does not seek nuclear weapons, maintains its satellite launches and rocket tests do not have a military component. South African police are investigating the deaths of at least 21 people at a nightclub in the coastal town of East London on Sunday. It is unclear that which led to the deaths of the young people who were reportedly attending a party to celebrate the end of winter school exams. Cause of the death is unknown yet. In Colombia, at least six people died and more than 200 injured in an accident that took place at the venue of a bullfight in Il Espinal city on Sunday. The spectators were reportedly watching the bullfight when several stands collapsed. However, it is unclear what caused these stands to collapse. The bullfighting practice is customary in many Spanish-speaking countries, while four states in Mexico have already banned bullfighting. Thousands protested in Madrid on Sunday against the NATO summit which will take place next week in the Spanish capital. While the motto, no to Oten, yes to peace, the demonstrators walked through the streets with banners and flags and expressed their opposition to wars and military spending. Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett convened his weekly cabinet meeting on Sunday for what is likely his last as Premier. Parliament is expected to dissolve this week, triggering new elections expected around the end of October. The elections the fifth Israel has held in three years deepen an unprecedented political crisis in Israel. At the meeting, Bennett discussed a series of accomplishments under his government and thanked ministers. And with that, time now for all the sporting action. Starting with cricket, opener Mayank Agarwal has been called up to join the Indian squad in the UK as cover for skipper Rohit Sharma, who has been rendered doubtful for the edge baston test against England after testing positive for COVID-19. Rohit is under isolation. The 31-year-old Agarwal has missed out and making the 15-man squad for the game starting July 1, but an opportunity has come his way as KL Rahul got injured just ahead of the South Africa series and now Rohit has contracted infection. Former India opener Virinder Sehwag has said that the skipper Rohit Sharma could be relieved from captaincy duties in the T20 format, which would allow him to manage his workload better. Rohit has not been able to feature in all India's matches since taking over as captain due to injuries and workload management. In tennis now, the 135th edition of Wimbledon kicked off today. While eyes will be on the Grand Slam record holder Rafael Nadal and Novak Djokovic, players like Ra Roger Federer alongside the two, top two of the men's singles, Daniel Medvedev and Alexander Zverev, miss out on that event. On the other hand, Serena Williams returned to Wimbledon for her first Grand Slam in a year after an extended break. It is worth noting that the grass court event will not carry ten tennis ranking points this year as a penalty for banning Russian and Belarusian players from competing. In badminton, PV Sindhu will look to quickly recover from her first round exit at Indonesia, while HS Pronoy will eye another consistent show as the duo spread head the Indian Challenge at the Malaysia Open Super 750 tournament starting in Kuala Lumpur on Tuesday. 
Talking about football now, the Indian women's team suffered a 0-2 defeat against Mexico in their last match of the sixth Tornio female U-17 football tournament in Willis, Italy on Sunday. Mexico netted one in each half to wrap up the match with Catherine Siles and Alice Gallegos getting an on the score sheet. And before we wrap, let's take a look at the headlines once again. India committed to green growth and clean energy. Prime Minister Narendra Modi addresses G7 session on climate, energy and health. Meets heads of Germany, US, France and South Africa. G7 tightened sanctions on Russia set to cap Russian oil prices. Promises support to Ukraine for as long as it takes. Opposition presidential candidate Yash Vansena files nomination. Top opposition leaders including Rahul Gandhi, Sharad Pawar, Akhilesh Yadav present. TRS extends support. Supreme Court grants relief to rebel Shiv Sena MLAs, puts disqualification proceedings on hold till 11th July. Ask Uddhav government to provide security to rebel MLAs. Flood situation improves in Assam. 22 lakh people are still reeling under floods. Relief and rescue operations continue. And that's all we have in this bulletin. To keep yourself updated, stay tuned to Sansa TV. Till then, good night. Namaskar.